Well, today we are starting a new sermon series, as you can see from your worship guide, called Not Shaken. Not Shaken. We're going to talk about God's power and plan for your pain. And specifically, we're going to be talking about adversity and suffering and going through difficulties for the next few weeks. Just about a month and a half ago, I guess it was, maybe a little bit longer, I was in my office at home and I was preparing a sermon on a Thursday afternoon when Carter, my daughter, she came and she knocked on the door more like a bang. And she says, Dad, have you seen this? I said, seen what? And I opened the door. She was looking at her phone. She says, the theater is closed. Y'all yeah, remember that? I remember that day? That was a Thursday. Now, this was news to us. We had no warning, no forecast. We didn't even know they were getting close or even thinking about this. And the message, and we learned this the same way you did, through Facebook, Uh, the the, the message was not that they were closing, they were closed that day. And so immediately I'm thinking, what are we going to do? Are we even going to be able to meet there this Sunday? I mean, what does that mean? That was not a good day for me. All of us have experienced days like that, seasons like that, where you receive bad news, scary news, It might be that you heard that you or someone you know has cancer. You might get laid off. You might fail an important class in school. You might have serious marriage problems. Someone important to you might die. You might lose an important customer to a competitor. The stock market may tank and you may lose a lot of your savings. I could go on and on. A lot of us experience, we all experience days like that, seasons like that. Now, whenever we do, whenever we go through difficult times, enter into a storm, how should we respond? That's the focus of this sermon series. How do you respond to difficulties? Not how do you avoid difficulties. We know that's not possible. But how do you respond? Well, we know how we shouldn't respond. We shouldn't be shaken. God doesn't want us to be shaken by the trials and the afflictions that we face. And so the sermon series is based on a passage in 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 2 through 3. I came across this verse in my quiet time, and I said, that is a great theme for a sermon series on adversity. 1 Thessalonians 3, verses 2 through 3. The Apostle Paul is writing, and he says, And we sent Timothy, our brother and God's co-worker in the gospel of Christ, to strengthen and encourage you concerning your faith so that no one will be shaken by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we are appointed to this. So the church in Thessalonica, they were experiencing severe persecution. And Paul is writing to him and he says, We sent Pastor Timothy to you to strengthen you, encourage you in your faith so that you won't be shaken so that you won't be shaken by the afflictions that you're facing. So we know that God doesn't want us to be shaken. What does it mean to be shaken by afflictions? Well, it means to get angry with God and to run away from God. It means to self-medicate with drugs and alcohol, to cover the pain with sin, to try to solve the problem with sin, to go outside of God's will to provide and meet, meet your needs. It means to panic with fear and worry and anxiety. It means to lose your faith in God altogether and just say, well, I don't think God exists because he allowed this to happen. To be shaken is to get angry and bitter, even taking it out on those that you love. To be shaken is to seek revenge, to get depressed, maybe even to end your life. And so we know God doesn't want us to be shaken. This sermon series is, is all about how do we enter into storms, how do we face the storms of life, how do we endure the storms of life without being shaken. And so how do we do that? Well, let me start with a a quick story. This is a story you're probably very familiar with. It's the story of Jesus and his disciples. Jesus had finished a long day of teaching and ministry, and he and his disciples decided to to get get in a boat on the Sea of Galilee and cross to the other side of the sea. And while they're in the middle of the sea a great storm arose and the boat is rocking and the waves are super high and and water is coming in and swamping the boat. And so the disciples are freaking out. They're terrified. They're panicking. They're worried. They think they're going to die. 
Where is Jesus during, this, during all this? Do you remember? He's in the very back of the boat. He's sound asleep. Now, how in the world do you sleep during something like that? Well, there's two possible reasons. Number one, he could just be a hard sleeper. How many of you is a hard sleeper? When I was in college, is that you? Did you raise your hand? I would say you're a good sleeper. That's for sure. When I was in college, my freshman year, I had a couple of friends. This may, be, may not be appropriate for church, so parents, you might want to. Uh, I had a couple of friends in the BCN, the Baptist Collegiate Ministry, and uh, a couple of girls, and they were roommates. And uh, one of them had a child, and so they were living in the dorms that you can have a child and, on campus. And one night, somebody broke into the apartment murdered one of the girls. Terrible. The other girl, who's in another room, she slept through the entire thing. Didn't hear a word. Man, that's a hard sleeper. So maybe that's what Jesus was. He was just a hard sleeper. The other possible reason why Jesus didn't wake up is because he was at perfect peace. He was at perfect peace in his heart. Like, he didn't have any fear. He didn't worry. He had complete confidence, complete faith in God. And so I think it's the second one. He was at perfect peace because when the disciples went to wake him up, Jesus' response was, guys, why are you afraid? Don't you have any faith? So Jesus, he wasn't afraid. He was at perfect peace. He was sleeping in the midst of the storm because he was at perfect peace. Did you know the Bible says that we can respond to storms that way too? I'm not saying we can sleep through them, but that would be nice to be able to sleep at night whenever you're going through a storm. Have you ever had a storm that you're going through, a trial that you're going through that keeps you up at night? Can you imagine just being able to sleep peacefully through the storm? The Bible says we can respond to trials like that. Not be shaken, just, but just be at perfect peace. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. We're going to find the the passage in the Bible that teaches us how to respond to the storms of life in perfect peace. It's Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. Philippians 4, 4 through 7. It says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your graciousness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Don't worry about anything, but in everything, through prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So what do you do when you enter a storm? This passage gives us five things to do. When you enter a storm, when you're in a storm as a Christian, how do you respond? And the first thing it says to do is to rejoice in the Lord, what? Rejoice in the Lord always. It says in verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. To rejoice is to express your incredible happiness. That's what the word rejoice means, to ex express your incredible happiness. Now, to rejoice in the Lord is to express your incredible happiness about God about your relationship with God, and about who God is. But this passage says, rejoice in the Lord always. So that means you're to express your incredible happiness about who God is when you enter a storm, when you're in a storm. The whole time, you're to rejoice in the Lord always. So when you enter a storm, this passage is saying, if you want to experience God's peace, if you want to not be shaken, the first thing you do is you rejoice in the Lord. That means you praise and you worship God. You're praising and you're worshiping God. When you enter a storm, the first thing you do is you worship. The first thing you do is you praise the Lord. You praise the Lord that he is love. God is love, which means he always does what is best for you. You praise the Lord that he's in control and that nothing can happen to you without his permission. You praise the Lord that he's going to work all things together for your good. In this sermon series, by the way, we're going to look at that verse, Romans 8, 28. Praise the Lord when you enter a storm because the Bible says that God is almighty. There's no problem. 
that he can't handle. There's no need that he can't meet. Praise the Lord when you enter a storm because God promises to always take care of you. Praise the Lord when you enter a storm because God is all-knowing. He knows exactly what's going on in your life, and he knows exactly what you need. And so when you enter a storm, you praise the Lord. You rejoice in the Lord. Now, this is counterintuitive, right? I mean, you've been through enough trials to know this is not natural. This is the opposite of what we feel like doing when we enter a storm. Now, it makes sense to praise the Lord, to rejoice in the Lord when you have a victory, when you have a breakthrough, when you emerge from the storm. That's when you praise the Lord, But this verse is saying, when you enter a storm, praise the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord always. When we enter a storm, we tend to get angry and worried and we panic. We get frustrated. This says, no, instead, praise the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord when you enter a storm. Now, why does it tell us to do that? Why should we praise the Lord in and during hard times. When you praise the Lord, it puts your problems in the proper perspective. When you praise the Lord, it puts your problems in the proper perspective. I want want you to think about David and Goliath, that famous story about David fighting the huge Philistine giant Goliath. Do you remember everybody in Israel was terrified of Goliath? All the great soldiers, the great men of battle, even King Saul, they were terrified to face Goliath. But if you look at David's words in that story, what stands out is his confidence. David was super, David was not even a soldier. He was a teenager, wasn't even in in the military. But he, he couldn't wait to go out and face Goliath. He was filled with confidence. Why is that? It's because everybody else was comparing Goliath to themselves. David was comparing Goliath to God. David was saying to himself, and he said even to Goliath, he said, Who does this guy think he is? Does he know who he's talking to? He's talking about God. He's talking about the people of God. Does he know how big and strong God is? And so David was comparing Goliath to his, I'm sorry, he's comparing Goliath to God, which gave him so much confidence. And so whenever we don't take time to praise the Lord in our storms, when we don't take the time to worship, what we end up doing is we end up comparing our problems to ourselves and to our resources and to our strength and to our bank account. And and when we do that, our problems seem huge and unassailable and insurmountable and just gigantic. But whenever we praise the Lord as we emerge, as we enter a storm, while we're in the storm, we're continuing to worship the Lord. What we're doing is we're comparing our problems to God. It reminds us, compared to God, this is just a temporary annoyance. This is just a rock in my shoe. This is just a harmless fly compared to God. Keeps your problems in perspective. Notice that Paul gives this command twice in one verse. In verse 4, Paul says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Now, why does Paul give the command twice? I think it's for two reasons. First of all, because it's so important. Rejoice in the Lord. Hey, guys, rejoice in the Lord. It's really important. But the second reason he's saying it twice is because it's so unnatural and counterintuitive. This is not what we feel like doing. This is not what we tend to do or we're inclined to do. So he's saying, no, really, really, rejoice in the Lord. If you want God's peace, if you want to not be shaken, rejoice in the Lord. Praise and worship God the Lord, okay? So that's number one. Rejoice in the Lord always. Number two, what to do when you enter a storm is let your graciousness be known to everyone. Let your graciousness be known to everyone. Verse five, and by the way, let me just say this as a side note. I pray hard and spend a lot of time thinking about what to preach, what to put on the preaching menu for the year, for our church. And For some reason, God has us for the next four weeks talking about affliction, trials. That probably means God wants to equip you or me or us for something to come. So everything in your life might be peachy right now, might be great. But I know for all of us, you know, life is is usually pretty steady, pretty normal, and then we hit a 
we hit a major problem. Then it goes back, and it's pretty normal most of the time. Then we hit a big problem. I don't know what's on the horizon for you and for me, but, but God has us here for a reason. So be taking some notes so that you're ready, okay? So the second thing to do whenever you enter a storm is to let your graciousness be known to everyone. Verse 5, let your graciousness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Now, what does it mean to be gracious? To be gracious is to be marked by kindness and courtesy. It means kind, polite, and generous. It means behaving in a pleasant, polite, and calm way. So in other words, Paul is talking about trials, affliction, troubles, and he's saying when you go through a hard time, continue to treat people right. When you go through a hard time, continue to be pleasant and nice to the people in your life. Now the temptation when we go through hard times, is to throw the fruit of the Spirit out the window. Has that ever happened to you? Throw love out the window. Kindness, patience, self-control with my mouth. I mean, everything goes out the window because I'm, I'm panicking right now. And I'm going through this major problem. And so I'm taking it out on everybody around me. And I don't care. Because, and, I, and I have the right to because of what I'm going through right now. But what this verse is saying is when you're going through the hard times, rejoice in the Lord always and let your graciousness be known to everyone. Let it be apparent to those around you. Continue to treat the people in your life well, even though you're going through hard times. The old saying is true. Hurt people hurt people. Whenever we get hurt, whenever we're hurting, the natural thing to do is to hurt the people around us. Not necessarily on purpose. It's just that we're focusing all of our attention on ourselves and on getting this pain to go away. And so we forget about the people around us and we mistreat and sometimes abuse the people around us. But this verse is saying, continue to be Christ-like with your attitude and with your words and with your demeanor. Continue to be Christ-like to the people around you. And if you screw up, and you probably will, then apologize. You say, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that, I shouldn't have acted that way, I shouldn't have done that, I'm going through a difficult time, but it's no excuse, I'm sorry. And this will help you to increase your influence in the lives of the people around you. This will help you with your Christian witness. When the people around you see how you're behaving, that you're behaving Christ-like in the middle of a storm, they'll, they'll be like, wow, that's amazing. Because when you go through a storm, everybody expects that you're not going to be at your best. Everybody expects you're not going to be joyful and you're not going to be nice and you're not going to be courteous and considerate. And so if you are the opposite of that, if you are, if you continue to be Christ-like and considerate and gracious, people are going to take notice of that. Notice what it says at the end of verse 5. It says, Let your graciousness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. The Lord is near. Now, you may remember from our study of Revelation that the Greek word for near, it means close in time or close in proximity, close in distance. And so you have to look at the context and try to figure out, is he talking about close in time or close in proximity? Now, there are some Bible teachers and and, um, Bible scholars who have interpreted this verse to mean Paul is saying, let your graciousness be known to everyone because Jesus is coming back soon. Now, that's not a good translation of the Greek word, number one. And number two, that would mean Paul is a liar because Paul wrote this 2,000 years ago and Jesus has not come back yet. So he's not saying, let your graciousness be known to everyone because Jesus is coming back any day now. No. What he's saying is, let your graciousness be known to everyone because God is right next to you. That God is within you. And why is he saying that? I believe Paul is saying... Even though you're going through a hard time, God is watching you and God is going to hold you accountable for how you treat the people around you. In other words, you're going through a difficult time, but you're not off the hook for how you treat the people around you. You still need to be gracious. You still need to be considerate. You still need to love your neighbor as yourself, even when you're going through a difficult time. And so this second thing we need to do as we enter a storm in the midst of our adversity, treat people right because God is watching Okay, number three, what to do when you enter a storm, don't worry about anything. 
Don't worry about anything. That's verse 6. Don't worry about anything. So this, this little verse tells us what not to do. Don't worry. Don't be anxious. What is worry? Worry is to keep thinking about unpleasant things that might happen or about problems that you have. It's to keep thinking. It's to feel nervous and upset because you keep thinking about a problem that you have or could have in the future. One of the definitions that I've used over the years for worry is worry is freaking out and stressing out about what might happen so that you're distracted from your mission and responsibilities and you're blocked from enjoying the riches that you have in Christ. Another definition that I've used is worry is a perpetual consuming fear of what might happen. It's perpetual. In other words, when you start worrying, it's continuous. It's nonstop. It's ongoing. It doesn't go away. It stays with you when you go to work. It stays with you whenever you're uh, trying to sleep at night. It's perpetual. It's ongoing. Researchers at the University of Idaho, they say that worry is the act of continually repeating the same thinking pattern over and over and over. So it's per perpetual, but it's also consuming. Worry consumes you so much that whenever you start worrying, it becomes all you can do. It's all you can think about. And so when you start worrying, it's hard to focus on anything else. It's hard to focus on your studies. It's hard to pray. It's hard to sleep. It's hard to work. It's hard to praise. It's hard to listen to a sermon because your mind is worried. You're thinking about that, that unpleasant thing that is happening to you or might happen to you. The word worry comes from an old English word which originally means to strangle. So when you worry, it feels like you're being strangled. In fact, anxiety can literally cause you to be short of breath. The Greek word for worry means to cut the heart in pieces. Worry is emotionally painful. It's a terrible state to be in. Worry can cause physical problems like an upset stomach, headaches, muscle tension. Some of you feel bad and you're wondering, what's wrong with me? You go to the doctor, the doctor's like, I don't know. You're like, I feel terrible. It might be worry. Worry interferes with your appetite, sleep, job performance. It's no wonder that so many people try to cope with worry and anxiety by self-medicating with food, smoking, drugs, and alcohol. George Burns, he said, the, the, he said if you ask me what is the single most important key to longevity, I would have to say it's avoiding worry, stress, and tension. And if you didn't ask me, I'd still have to say it. So in Matthew chapter 6, this is Jesus' words on worry. Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34. This is a, a bigger passage, but I think it's worth reading right now as we talk about worry. Jesus said this, Therefore I tell you, don't worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Isn't life more than food and the body more than clothing? Consider the birds of the sky. They don't sow or reap or gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you worth more than they? Can any of you add one moment to his lifespan by worrying? And why do you worry about clothes? Otherwise, oh, I'm sorry, observe how the wildflowers of the field grow. They don't labor or spin, thread. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was adorned like one of these. If that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and thrown into the furnace tomorrow, won't he do much more for you? You of little faith. So don't worry, saying, what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be provided for you. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow, because tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So Jesus gives us five reasons not to worry right there. Five reasons. The first thing he says, it distracts you from what is most important. Worry distracts you from what's most important. In verse 25, he says, isn't life more than food and the body more than clothing? When you worry, you're focusing all of your attention on material, earthly, temporal things. And you're taking your attention off of spiritual, eternal matters. 
So it distracts you from what's most important. The second reason not to worry is that it's unnecessary since God promises to care for you. You, don't, you literally don't need to worry. If you're a child of God, God promises he's got you. He's going to take care of you. He says in verse 26, Consider the birds of the sky. They don't sow or reap or gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you worth more than they? God feeds the birds. You're way more valuable to God than birds. If he feeds them, he's going to feed you. He's going to take care of you. And then verse 33 is my life verse, my favorite verse in the Bible. He says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be provided for you. Focus on your, when you're worried, focus on your relationship with God. He's going to take care of everything else. Third reason why you don't need to worry, Jesus says, is that it doesn't help. It doesn't help. Verse 27, Jesus says, Can any of you add one moment to his lifespan by worrying? It doesn't help. It's, it's, it's not productive. And then number four, you don't need to worry because it's an act of atheism. It's an act of atheism. You're acting like an atheist, like somebody who doesn't have a heavenly father, doesn't believe that God exists. In verse 32, he says, For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. So worry is functional atheism. When you worry, you're acting like God is in control, like he doesn't love you, like he doesn't know what you're going through, and like he's not going to take care of you. It's functional atheism. And then the last reason Jesus gives for not worrying is that it distracts you from the present. What's that old saying? Yesterday's history, tomorrow is a mystery, today is a gift, is the present. And so today is is really where our focus needs to be. But as long as you're worrying, you're not focusing on today, which is really all we have control over. In verse 34, Jesus says, Therefore don't worry about tomorrow, because tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. That's always been my motivation to not worry. It's because... When you're worried, you're not being the best husband and father you can be today. Your attention, your energy is elsewhere. You're not in the present. You're not in the moment. All right, let's go to number four. So don't worry about anything. Here's number four, what to do when you enter a storm. In everything, present your requests to God. In everything, present your requests to God. So now Paul is moving on to prayer. Verse six, again, he says, don't worry about anything. That's what you shouldn't do, now what should you do? But in everything, through prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. So Paul first begins that verse, verse 6, by saying, don't worry. Now, have you ever been worried and you're thinking, I know the Bible says don't worry, but I'm having a hard time. That's like saying, stop being hungry. Or stop being lonely. It's telling you to stop feeling a certain way. And and that's almost impossible to do unless you focus your attention on something else. And that's what Paul is saying. Instead of using your energy, your mind, because you remember, worry is thinking about something over and over. Instead of worrying, pray. That's how you stop worrying. You focus your attention on praying. You spend your time pouring out your heart, pouring out your requests to the Lord. How do you respond to problems? You pray and you pray. What do you do when you're tempted to worry? You pray. And in this verse, Paul gives three synonyms for prayer. He says prayer, petition, and requests. All of them mean the same thing. Prayer, petition, requests. Pray. 1 Peter 5, 7. It says, give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about you. That word worries there is the same Greek word for worry in the passage we're studying. Don't worry about anything. Give all your worries, give all your cares to God. How do you do that? How do you give your cares to God? You pray. You pray. You put it in his hands. I love how Philippians 4, 6, it says, In everything, in everything, present your requests to God. In other words, there's nothing too big to give to God in prayer. There's nothing too small. One person said, there's nothing too great for God's power and nothing too small for his fatherly care. No matter how big or small it is, God cares about it. You can pray about it. 
There's so many stories in the Bible about the power of prayer. Do you remember the story of King Hezekiah? Some of you may not be familiar. King Hezekiah, he came after David. He was one of David's descendants, but he was the king of the nation of Judah, a very godly king, awesome king, one of the greatest kings that, that Judah ever had. And he became terminally ill with some kind of skin disease. Could have been skin cancer or something. And so the prophet Isaiah comes to him, comes to his room. Hezekiah's in bed. And the prophet Isaiah says, Hezekiah, the Lord has told me you need to get your house in order. Get your plans together because you're about to die. So Hezekiah, he <laughs> says he wept and he turned to face the wall, the, the, the and he began to pour out his heart to the Lord. And he prayed for healing. And so before Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, had left his room, God sent another message to Isaiah. said, turn around, go back to Hezekiah, and said, I've heard his prayer. So Isaiah went back to him and said, Hezekiah, the Lord says he's going to heal you, and he's going to give you 15 more years to live. That's the power of prayer. Another story I love is the story of Hannah. Hannah was pretty much an obscure figure in the Old Testament. The Bible doesn't say much about her. It just says that she was barren. She couldn't have any children. These days, young women purposefully decide not to have children, <coughs> young women who are married. Um, but back then, it was a terrible thing. The thing that a, a husband and a wife wanted more than anything else were children. They wanted to, to be fruitful and multiply. She couldn't have children, and she was teased, and she was ridiculed about it. And so when she went to the tabernacle one year to worship, she poured out her heart to the Lord, and she said, Lord, just please give me a child. And God heard her, and God opened up her womb and gave her a child. It was the prophet Samuel. Her child was Samuel, who grew up to be the, the leader of Israel, the prophet and the judge of Israel. God answers prayer, and <laughs> prayer changes things, but more than that, prayer is therapeutic. It doesn't just change our circumstances. It's therapeutic. It changes our hearts. It gives us peace. It gives us joy. M.R. Vincent said, peace is the fruit of believing prayer. Prayer helps us not to worry. It helps us not to panic. It helps us not to fear. What happens when you pray and the worry doesn't go away? What happens when you pray and the fear is still there? What do you do? You keep praying. You keep praying. Not only that, but you, you ask somebody else, can you pray with me? And then you ask the other people, can you pray for me? Join me in prayer. I'm going through this difficult time and I'm worried about it. And then one more thing. What do you do when you enter a storm? This is number five, is to give thanks. Give thanks. Verse six says, don't worry about anything, but in everything through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. The last thing you do when you enter a storm is to give thanks. The first thing you do is to rejoice in the Lord always. You're rejoicing, you're praising the Lord, you're worshiping the Lord, but you're also giving thanks. What's the difference between rejoicing in the Lord and giving thanks? Rejoicing the Lord is praising the Lord for his attributes, for who he is. He's loving he is almighty. He is righteous. He is sovereign and in complete control. So you're praising the Lord for who he is. To give thanks is to express your gratitude for previous blessings. It's to express your gratitude for the things that God has already done for you in the past. So it should be obvious the power of thanksgiving. So when you're in a storm, and as you're giving thanks, what you're doing is you're focusing on the good things and not just on the bad things. And you're focusing on what God has already given you and what he hasn't given you. And you're focusing on what God has already done for you, not on what he hasn't yet done for you. And so naturally, that is going to pick up your spirits. That's going to lift your spirits. That's going to help you to overcome worry and panic and fear. It's going to help you to endure the storm. You guys have heard of Katy Perry, who is not a model Christian but she was raised in a Christian home, I believe by ministers uh, in the Assembly of God Church. So she's trying. But there was an article about her in the Christian Post recently, and it said when, back in 2017, she broke up with her boyfriend. Her boyfriend broke up with her. And this brought her, brought her to the place where she was almost suicidal. She almost wanted to take her life. 
And she said that the thing that got her through, the thing that saved her life was gratitude, was remembering to give thanks. She said, every day I start my day by giving thanks. She said, that's what got me out of that storm. That's what got me through that storm. It was gratitude. A large and growing body of studies have found that exercising gratitude leads to better sleep, improves interpersonal relationships, leads to better stress and hormonal regulation, and even reduces physical pain. So that's why I love that acronym ACTS, A-C-T-S, that we use for prayer. When you're in your prayer time, you start out by rejoicing in the Lord, adoration, and then confession, and then what's the T? Thanksgiving, and then supplication, when you're asking God what you, for what you need. So if you're spending daily time in prayer and you're going through ACTS, every day you're going to be reminded to praise the Lord, to rejoice in the Lord, and to give thanks. That'll help you get through your storms. And so the promise is found in verse 7. To those who take the five actions that we've just discussed, there's this promise. This promise is amazing in verse 7. It says, And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. The peace of God. What is this peace? This peace is the feeling of tranquility or calmness, a feeling of confidence or a sense of well-being that everything's going to be okay. It's like God is saying in your spirit, it's all right, it's okay, I've got you. This passage tells us two things about this peace. It's the peace of God, it says, first of all. That means two things. First of all, this peace, it comes from God. It's not a peace that can be obtained from anywhere else or produced by anything else. It's the peace of God. It only comes from Him. It's supernatural. It comes from your relationship with Him. And also the peace of God means that it's the peace that God Himself has. It's God's kind of peace. So God does not panic. He does not worry. He is not afraid. Remember Jesus in the back of the boat? The Son of God? It's because he had the peace of God. He's not worried or afraid. He's at perfect peace. So it's God's kind of peace. And then the second thing it says about this peace is that it surpasses all understanding. Moises Silva said God's peace transcends our intellectual powers precisely because believers experience it when it is unexpected in circumstances that appear to make it impossible. So it's reasonable and it's normal to freak out. It doesn't make sense if you're at perfect peace in the midst of a storm. It surpasses all understanding, but that's what God promises us if we can respond in the right way. So when you go through a storm, rejoice in the Lord. Be gracious. Don't worry about anything. Pray about everything. Give thanks. God promises his peace. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just want to praise you right now. You are awesome. You are good. You're almighty. You're present. You're right here with us this moment. You see everything that we're going through. You know exactly what's happening to us right now and what we're feeling. We praise you, Lord, because you promised to take good care of us, to work everything together for our good. Lord, I pray for, for everybody in this room. I pray for myself. I pray for our church, Lord, as we face storms in the coming days. Help us to not be shaken. Help us to remember Philippians chapter 4. Help us to go there. Help us to put it into practice. Give us your peace, Lord. Help us to trust in you. Just to have confidence that you are watching. You're in control. You've got us. You're going to take care of us. Lord, I pray for anybody in our church right now, anybody in this room who is going through a devastating, terrifying trial right now, Lord, as a church, we pray for their, their peace. We pray that you would get them through it, Lord, that you would strengthen them, love on them, give them wisdom, give them your perspective. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.